patterns. I mean, what were the changes in the, um, in the security model? And uh, the final, and I would say the most interesting part of the talk is how to still exploit the Google Chrome extensions, which are, uh, let's say, up to date with, with uh, uh, security uh, features. So Chrome extensions are not to be, uh, um, uh, they are not Java plugins, they are not Flash plugins, this is, n this is not uh, the other kind of applications, this, these are just HTML5 applications uh, distributed by Chrome Web Store. Uh, and they are really interesting from a research point of view or from attacker's point of view because they get access to the highly privileged API. Uh, some Chrome extensions can, for example, uh, totally bypass same origin policy for the website that you are visiting. Uh, they can access uh, the contents of your tabs, they can uh, modify the DOM of the web pages that you are visiting, they can access your browsing history, your cookies, uh, your bookmarks, and so on and so on. This is why, why they are really um, interesting. Uh, they are much more powerful than the usual HTML applications. And as it turns out, they have similar vulnerabilities because they are all written in JavaScript. Uh, when we think about uh, what a typical Chrome extension uh, consists of, it's very uh, important to distinguish two different types of components. The first type of component are UI pages. These are HTML pages. Uh, one, of, one of them is background page, so you don't really see, it, see that it's running in the background. But uh, these are HTML documents, of course, with a JavaScript running inside. Uh, that form the user interface of an extension. And uh, they are really important because they get the access to the uh, privileged API. And the other part of uh, uh, Chrome extensions usually are content scripts. Content scripts are just small JavaScript snippets uh, being, that are being attached to the, uh, to the website that you are visiting. And they run in, uh, alongside the, the usual website JavaScript. So they run in HTTP origin or HTTPS origin. Uh, they don't have access to the privileged API, uh, but they may modify or access the DOM of the original website. Let's, for example, uh, here uh, there's an extension which can uh, uh, highlight some, some of the keywords, right? Uh, so when you look at the whole picture, is uh, that the content scripts get access to the DOM of the website uh, the user visits. Uh, as well as, as the usual JavaScript that runs on a, on a page. But uh, the background page or other UI pages, only, only those have access to the powerful API. And there's this clear security boundary uh, between those two components. They cannot, uh, let's say, they cannot call each other's code. They don't have access to it. They can only communicate by, by something which is similar to the post message API, the HTML5 one. Uh, of course, uh, as um, a highly privileged applications, they need to be somehow governed. And, and uh, manifest file is the, is the single file which describes the permissions that the uh, extension needs access to here. Uh, the origins that it is allowed to modify. Uh, here you can, you can also see that there's a background page and this is the, the uh, URL of that page. And uh, for all Google visited websites, uh, there's gonna be two scripts um, uh, embedded by the um, Google Chrome browser. And uh, important distinction, this is the manifest version, uh, version two, which is the current version of the manifest. So uh, to sum up, uh, we have UI pages, which run in a Chrome extension origin, highly privileged origin. They have access to the Chrome API, which is really uh, a powerful thing from, from an attacker's point of view, but they are limited by permissions declared, declared in the manifest file and don't get access to the uh, DOM of the, of the website. On the other hand, we have content scripts, which, which run uh, in HTTP. Uh, they get access to the DOM of the website, of course, uh, limited by the URLs that is specified in the manifest file, but they don't get access to the Chrome API. Uh, one important distinction um, uh, as well, uh, the JavaScript code that is running in a content script gets access to the DOM, but it doesn't see the, uh, uh, it doesn't see the JavaScript code running in the website. They also cannot call each other's functions. That would be you know, disastrous from a security perspective. Um, so they can modify and often, often cooperate, um, like negotiate some content over the DOM, but they cannot directly call each other. Uh, so last year, I was exploiting a lot of uh, V1 extensions. 
and the most disastrous vulnerability class uh, that was discovered was the UI page DOM XSS. I won't describe what DOM XSS is, Stefano already did this. Uh, so, uh, what is in, in important thing, uh, important thing here in DOM XSS, what is uh, really unique to uh, Google Chrome extensions, uh, uh, DOM XSS in UI pages, is that the original payload is somewhere in HTTP origin. So, a user visits a malicious website, or the website uh, with a prepared exploit for a first extension. Uh, the code of an extension fetches the payload from the DOM in the, by the content script, sends it uh, with the post message API to the, let's say, background page, and, and now th this particular content travels from HTTP origin to the Chrome extension origin. And, of course, this code gets access to the, uh, to the extension API. So uh, this, is, this was really uh, disastrous for most of the extensions because, uh, uh, because well, this API that um, the, ex the, exploit the exploiter got, uh, got into was uh, really uh, allowed him to, to do many things. Uh, for example, you could even change the proxy settings of, of your user's browser. Uh, uh, but I'm a... I'm a guy who re really likes to write tools, so I wrote, wrote a tool to exploit uh, Chrome extensions. I didn't want to uh, make a proof of concept with a simple alert, right? So I wrote a um, Chrome extension exploitation framework, uh, which is something like Beef, from, for, but for Chrome extensions. So it allowed you to, uh, to give, it gave you a hook code, so you injected, instead of alert one, you injected just a, just a small JavaScript snippet, and once it executed in the Chrome extension zone, uh, it's connected back to the to the server, and, and you got the really nice console. When you could you could navigate, uh, uh, you could see all the tabs that the user has opened, all his cookies for, for current domain, or local storage, for example. Uh, you could have multiple payloads. Uh, um, uh, you could I don't know get the cookies for a particular domain, change proxy settings, whatever. Grab Google contacts. Well, basically, we, we took over the browser uh, of the user. Uh, and it was a problem, because the XSS vulnerabilities, as you probably know, are pretty common. And they are pretty common also in, in Google Chrome extensions. Uh, but when you exploit an application, you only exploit one origin. When you exploit the Google Chrome extension, you basically take over most of the origins. Or every, uh, uh, you get access to the API that the original extension uh, wanted to have access to. And a lot of them have really uh, asked for a lot of permissions. So, there were note-taking applications, developer tool applications, RSS readers, they were all easily exploitable. And uh, the thing that Google did was uh, introducing content security policy uh, to the code of Google Chrome extensions. They made uh, uh, a manifest version 2 extensions, uh, which has obligatory content security policy for an extension code. So, this is the default policy. Uh, Sometimes you could relax it, but not a little bit. But of course, uh, you would have to relax it in the manifest file. So you would have to be the extension author. You, could, you couldn't do that externally. So uh, this default content security policy basically says there's no evil in friends, there's no inline scripting, and there uh, no external scripts from HTTP or HTTPS origin can be loaded. Uh, as you could imagine, this makes access ex exploitation uh, very, very difficult. Uh, without having access to, let's say, eval or inline scripting. Uh, and, of course, they enforced uh, manifest version 2. So, right now, uh, you can't find the old extensions in a Chrome Web Store, and by January next year, uh, your Chrome browser will stop running the old legacy extensions. Only, only extensions based on manifest version 2 could continue to run. So, a question arose, are we fixed? I mean, is the uh, world of Chrome extensions uh, already secure and there's no point in researching that? Uh, well, it turned out it's not secure yet. I mean, uh, there are still uh, interesting vectors of attack, and some of them I will present uh, right now. Well, there's still a possibility to um, exploit the UI page XSS um, within Google Chrome extensions because uh, a lot of the extensions, it was already mentioned yesterday uh, on some talks, uh, a lot of JS templating libraries uh, depend on eval function to, 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 to be there, right? So, uh, 
it quickly became a problem uh, when a lot of extensions used those um, templating libraries. So Google decided, uh, after being under pressure from, from uh, extension developers, to allow specifying unsafe evil uh, within the uh, extension uh, content security policy. Uh, and you could imagine that once you uh, allow the unsafe evil, you, you become, uh, it is possible to exploit you. Uh, via abusing the eval function. So a lot of extensions currently, because they are using uh, the JS templating uh, libraries, are vulnerable because they uh, relax their own uh, content security policy. So it's an interesting uh, thing to look at when uh, assessing the code of an extension, let's say. Uh, but there's another vector. I mean, content scripts are not subject to content, secu to content security policy. It's only the UI pages that are. So go figure uh, what's, what I was targeting. So I was tar tar targeting this scenario. There's a payload somewhere in the DOM of a web page. The content script fetches the, uh, the, the payload and somehow executes it because it has a vulnerability over there. And, and, it's, uh, and it's complete. I mean, uh, there's a lot smaller code base that you need to look at to be able to exploit uh, this kind of vulnerabilities. Well, I don't even have to look at the, at the usually extensive code of, of the UI pages. I only need to look at a few code snippets that, that are in the content scripts. So, uh, what's the con what are the consequences? Well, right now I have an XSS in a HTTP domain. I, I kind of bypass the content security policy for Chrome extensions. Uh, I have access to the DOM, because I am a content script, and I have access to cookies. But if you think about it, that's as sexy as self-XSS, because I assume that I have control over the, uh, the original origin. I, I injected something into it. It went to the content script and went back into the DOM. So what's, what's the point of it? I mean, there is a point. Because uh, first, uh, remember the isolated words uh, concept. Uh, if the original uh, website was protected by a CSP, uh, now I'm bypassing it, because the code is running actually in the other isolated world. So it's not subject to the CSP of the original website. That's an interesting thing, but CSP is not that widely used yet. Uh, another thing uh, was uh, really um, interesting from an attacker's point of view. Notice that, this is the snippet from the documentation, content scripts can also make cross-site XML HTTP requests to the same sites as their parent extensions. And uh, these are the permissions for basically sending requests and reading responses from pretty much any website. And you know how many um, extensions use that permission? 40%. So, go figure. Uh, as I said, I'm a tool guy, so I wrote a tool to exploit that situation. Uh, it's on GitHub, of course, open source and stuff. It's... Uh, Yet another Chrome extension exploitation tool. It's basically XSS proxy by, for the new era. So uh, the architecture is like this. Uh, you're setting up a proxy, HTTPS proxy. Uh, as an attacker, you connect to it through, I don't know, Burp, SQL map, uh, your browser, whatever. And uh, of course, there's a payload to inject in, uh, in your victim's um, browser. Uh, and you send commands to it via uh, usual HTTP uh, proxy uh, protocol. And uh, you send requests over this, and over the WebSockets protocol, they are being transferred to the uh, XSS extension, XSS content script, and they are being requested by XML HTTP requests. Guess what? I have cookies over here. So the browser attaches the appropriate cookies. So I can read your Gmail account and, and, and whatnot uh, via this exploited extension. So let me show you a demo. So yeah, uh, this is a vulnerable uh, extension. It's called any.do. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an extension for uh, managing your tasks. And it integrates with your Gmail account. See, when I click on a Gmail, uh, there's a small addition here for adding a task. And the task is based uh, on um, current title of, of your email. So 
Who of you like HTML emails? I don't see a lot of hands. I like plain text emails as well, so I'm sending a plain text email to me, but it's a different kind of plain text email. Uh, so, uh, let's look at the actual email. See what happened? There's something fishy going on. And probably Mario, if he's around here, already knows what's, what's going on next. Uh, so I'm sending an email with a payload. Uh, I'm launching the, the actual proxy. It's running on port 4444. Um, and also I have a um, um, web server for hosting the, the actual payload. So I generate a hook code here, a simple evil uh, call. Uh, I attach it via script over here. Of course, in the real world, the victim wouldn't be sending email to himself. It would be an attacker. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, once I once I view the email, notice quickly that uh, uh, yeah, it started connecting to the mosquito proxy. And here's the URL of the page that's, you know, reported working. I, I'm hooked. That's uh, just a simple hello world. Now I'm, uh, I'm also chaining this via burp to, to, make it, uh, to make it easier to see. So burp is chaining to Mosquito, and I'm using burp as a, as a proxy for the uh, Firefox browser right now. So as you can, uh, as you can I'm launching a, a private mode to make sure that I don't have any cookies on my Firefox browser, which is the simulation of an attacker. And I can, I can quickly load the Gmail interface. As you can see here, there are uh, logs of X, XML HTTP requests being done by, by the um, exploited code. Uh, and these are the, the, um, the actual re requests going on at the net network layer. But what is really interesting is that I can now navigate to different origins. Uh, than the original, when the original exploit happened. So I'm going to Twitter, and I'm suddenly logged into Twitter with your cookies from, from, from the browser. And I can basically just you know, view the web over, uh, over your connection, over your browser with your authenticated um, sessions. So this is, this is kind of philosophical, because I have a, a cross-site scripting in, a, in an extension in an HTTP origin which is not that big deal uh, when coming to the situation from last year, let's say, when comparing it. But I still have quite a lot of possibilities with just a cross-domain um, uh, XHR. Uh, the extension, the current version is, of course, vulnerable. It's half a million users. Uh, uh, the, the vulnerability was not found by me. It was reported to me last week by Sergey Belov. Uh, the other thing, NPAPI API plugin vulnerabilities. Well, some extensions can also use like the binary code, like DLL functions, uh, to uh, implement some functionality. And there was an extension called uh, uh, CRGPG. It was an extension for proxying GPG uh, into Gmail interface. So uh, basically, the, if we consider binary code running over here, uh, this code is running outside any Chrome sandbox. It's just a binary code with, uh, 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 with the per full permissions of your operating system user. So if I found an extension with vulnerable code here, like common ejection vulnerability, uh, the exploitation would, would, would look like this. There's a payload in a DOM. It's being fetched by content script. It's being transferred to the background page. It's being forwarded to the NP API plugin. Here the vulnerability happens, and I can execute code, possibly. So I found an extension which was vulnerable to that. Uh, this extension was called CRGPG. Uh, it had an, this is the, the, the C code for, uh, I hope it's C, I'm not really you know, at that level. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, there's an obvious vulnerability, like common ejection vulnerability at this line. There's an untrusted parameter coming ultimately from the, from the DOM. It's the recipient, so basically it should be email addresses for the, uh, who are you trying to, um, to send the encrypted email to. Uh, and of course, it appended it blindly into, into the command line. So out of this, uh, the exploitation uh, uh, that was taking place was I was sending an encrypted email to my victim who was having this uh, vulnerable extension. 
And upon decryption, there was an XSS in a content script as well. And XSS in a content script allowed me to send arbitrary comments to the uh, background page of an extension. And uh, via that, I could easily exploit this vulnerability. And I had a, you decrypted my email, and I had a meta session uh, from your um, connection, right? Uh, so, this is still possible in, in, in Google Chrome extensions version 2 because uh, CSP doesn't really care about you know, binary vulnerabilities in, in some plugins. Uh, and there's a bonus slide over here. Mm, I found it two days ago. Uh, it turned out that some of the extensions actually use the new fancy file system API. Uh, and the new fancy file system API is basically a virtual file system in, in your browser. Of course, protected by same origin policy, so you cannot you know, poke into uh, file systems of other applications from other origins. Uh, the URL usually looks like this. I, the URL for a file stored uh, within the file system um, container. Uh, so if a HTTP uh, website uh, uses the file system, this is the full URL of, of a document. And if a Chrome extension does it, of course, it's, it's of different, um, uh, different, let's say, it's kind of equivalent of a hostname or something. Uh, I found an extension which, uh, by total coincidence, was presented also today by, by Erland. Uh, it's an extension for testing REST APIs. Of course, current version 100, 180 kilo users, uh, including, uh, including Erland. So, uh, let's see what happens with this. I found it by accident. Uh, so I started testing the uh, Postman. Yeah, I started testing the, the Postman extension with Mosquito, though I know it's probably of use because the, the place is protected by, by content security policy. And let's see how the interface looks like. So. Uh, I launched a REST client. It's basically an application to send requests to arbitrary domains. Of course, it's, it's a Chrome extension, so it has permissions to do uh, the actual requests. So I sent it the payload to connect to my Mosquito server. Just the usual, just the usual payload. And you know, the vulnerability is, is that you get to preview the actual uh, results. And of course, uh, as you can probably see, there's uh, no escaping being done on the, on the, in this case, JSON response. Uh, so if the script executed, I should have got the connection back. And actually I did, but it's from the strange file system uh, location, file system colon Chrome extension. This is the ID of the post end and temporary response. When I started looking at the code, it actually uh, turned out that uh, the REST, uh, uh, Postman REST plugin uh, stores the actual response in a virtual file system and then displays it in an iframe. So I started poking around what's still possible uh, and modified my uh, payload. Let's say if I'm framed, maybe I can alert parent location, for example. And I kind of can, but I mean, okay, I can read, usually I can read loca location cross origin, but uh, what if there's no same, or, I mean, uh, what if the file system resource is in the same origin as the web page that includes it? Though the scheme totally doesn't match. I mean, this is a document from Chrome extension scheme, and the other is from file system scheme. So by definition, it should be different origin. Actually, it turned out when I started uh, poking around in Chromium, uh, you know, Bazilla, uh, that they made a decision that the file system resources should be in origin with the actual website or Chrome extensions, in this case, uh, who created the resources. So uh, what you can actually do is you can totally execute any JavaScript code because you, have, you get the reference to the window, to the eval function, whatever, and Pay attention that the actual uh, code in here, the actual window was theoretically protected by CSP. 
So I can now execute arbitrary Java's code. In this, in this case, I, I was reading the local storage um, uh, properties from, from, the, from the extension, which consisted some secrets about uh, authentication data to other websites or whatever. But uh, this is a really quirky way to bypass the content security policy in uh, Chrome extensions, which still allow you to, uh, to launch the first, the first attack that I presented, the, the last year's attack. Uh, to launch the XSS chef against it and, uh, you know, get your cookies, whatever. Uh, so, to quickly sum it up, Chrome extensions version 2 are still uh, possible for, uh, uh, for accessing them. Uh, CSP, this is actually a quote by Adam Barth because I was, I was emailing him uh, today and yesterday about it. Um, CSP should be treated as a mitigation uh, from cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and not as a prevention mecha mechanism. Uh, this is why they made, uh, uh, they actually don't, don't care about um, such vulnerability uh, that I just, just presented. I mean, uh, the iframe should be sandboxed, uh, basically. Uh, and they don't care that, you know, something from a different scheme, just looking at the location, uh, is in origin with, with some other document, which is, for me, uh, uh, I don't really agree with it, but it's, you know, a uh, philosophical point of view. So basically, if there's a new tool for attack, go check it out, it's called Mosquito. Uh, and the, don't really, you know, be scared of content security policy because it's still bypassable even in Chrome extensions. Thank you. And the floor is open for your questions. Oh, you have to wait a second, I have to run. So you've shown that you can bypass this CSP in um, the Chrome extensions using the file system APIs, but if there were Web pages using the file system API, I suppose CSP should be also bypassed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like uh, that. yeah, that's the thing. I mean, uh, imagine a website which has a content security policy, a strict one, uh, done right, and it uses uh, a file system API, and somehow it renders the content uh, as HTML uh, via file system uh, URL. You can still navigate to parent and execute arbitrary code because. You know, you can't, uh, you can't even specify the content security policy for the file system document because there are no HTTP headers, no, 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 no API for setting the, the, the CSP for the um, uh, file system resources. So yeah, that would uh, bypass, I even have an example on my computer. Uh, you can bypass CSP of, of a website through, the, through this vector. Uh, hello. Uh, did you see, uh, did you research um, Mozilla Firefox extension? And I, this is a question, and my suggestion is to research it because it's much, much interesting thing in it, uh, especially in the older versions of, uh, of, of Mozilla Firefox extensions. Uh, I have not researched, uh, but I know a guy, I think he's even sitting here, Roberto. Uh, yeah. He's over there. He did research, an extensive research on Firefox extensions. And as I've been told last year, it's much more scarier than, than the Chrome model. So, Roberto, we expect you to submit a talk for the next conference. So, if you don't have any more questions, then thank Kuru again. Thank you again.